And Joey was doing well with his with his kidney, um, but I, I think they had to do something else this week. I haven't heard any update on that. Sure. I guess I would like to for our daughter. She's having her nose operated on Tuesday. Yeah. And it's skin cancer, and it's right on the end of her nose. And it's kind of hard for a woman to have that, not knowing what. All right. What's the, the What's her name? Janice. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. We'll, we'll go ahead and pray. Then. Lord, we praise you and thank you, God, for um, for healing, Lord. Thank you for for healings you've already you've already done. Um, thank you for uh, you know Shan's nephew for him coming back for healing uh, yes. the relationship thank with him, Lord. Lord. We praise you for that, God, and, and we pray also for um, Janice for for her her skin cancer, God, that you will you'll provide healing and that you will provide wisdom for the doctors and, and all those involved in peace, Lord, um, because you are a great healer and, and God, you you are um, you know more than able, Lord, and we pray that you continue to heal her in that situation, and we know um, you know other ones that are not mentioned here today. That, um, that you know them without us even speaking well. And we pray that you continue to, to work in those situations and that you will be glorified in, in our comings and goings and in all the great things that you are doing, that we will see you in it and, um, and others will see you in it as well. Right. Amen. Okay. Very good. So um, please, if I, if I get away from the microphone, let me know. Um, I want to make sure everybody can hear as we go through it. So, um, today we're going to talk about uh, how to read the Gospels to get more out of the Gospels as we, as we go through it, um, and, and what, we can, what we can learn from them, um, and, and how we can, we can go through. So, uh, I, I had notes out there, uh, we'll run through the notes, and please, anytime, you know, feel free to, to stop me or um, ask questions, you know, so... All right, we um, the gospels are, are a little unique in that there's that there's four of them that have, are speaking about the same message at the same time, um, and 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 there's there's three that are very very similar in that they are and they're called the synoptic gospels, which means um, seeing together. So they look through the same view at at um, at the gospel situation. Those are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, 90% of Luke is found in, or 90%, 91% of Mark is found in Matthew, and 53% of Mark is found in Luke. Um, so a lot of people are starting to believe that they come from the same source, right? That that could be, um, it could be uh, Peter's lectures. Peter was doing a lot of uh, storytelling. Mark is very much associated with, with Peter. And, and maybe they pulled a lot from, from his lectures. Um, so they, sometimes they think that Mark was written first and then Matthew and Luke kind of expanded on, on Mark. Um, or maybe there's even another document that's not found yet. 
that these all could have been based on uh, or oral traditions, right? So somebody, there was a lot of teaching and oral tradition that was made because um, that was poured into these because um, as we'll find out, only two of the gospels are written from eyewitness report. The other two are, are um, not of the 12. So Matthew is not named as Matthew, but it's unanimously attributed to him as um, the author. He's a first-hand account. He was one of the 12 disciples. Uh, he's a tax collector. It was written roughly in the time frame of 50 AD to 77 AD. Remember, Jesus' death ministry was from 30 AD to 33 AD when he, when he died. Um, Matthew takes a little bit more of a Jewish centered approach to the gospel. So it's, it's written more towards, towards a Jewish audience. And it was written in Greek. Uh, the main fulfillment, the main story portion of, of Matthew, the theme, is the fulfillment of the Old Testament through God, through Jesus. So it takes a lot of the, um, all the things that culminated to why he goes through the genealogy when he starts and talks specifically about how we got here and Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's the main thing. And the main, pur main purpose of this is to pr prove that Jesus was the Old Testament prophesied Messiah. So that he is the, the one, that he is Jesus, God's son, and it was specifically um, about him, everything leading up until that point. Mark, on the other hand, was not one of the 12. Mark was um, also is not named here, but they believe it, him, the author, to be John Mark, um, which is found in other writings throughout the, the, um, the Gospels. Largely focuses on the preaching of, te preaching of Peter. Was, he was very much a follower of Peter, spent a lot of time with him. Um, and also, this is the same Mark that accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Um, maybe we could read Acts 13, 5 through 13. And we'll hear a little bit about Mark. Somebody would like to read that? What is it? X 13, 5 through 13. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Papyrus. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who, who was an attendant of the proconsul. Sirius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for which is his name, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn to the proconsul from faith, from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at Elmaeus and said, <clears throat> You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop preventing the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. For Prophet Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Philom, well, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Okay. So this is this where it speaks about John. This is John Mark. So he spent a lot of time with. Um, with Paul, uh, it's also uh, believed he's the same one 
that, that deserted Paul and Barnabas at the end causing a split between Paul and Barnabas. That, that Barnabas wanted to take him on future mission trips and, and Paul was so adamantly against it that, um, that he and Barnabas went separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark and, and Paul uh, went with Timothy. Um, let's read also in, in Colossians 4.10. <clears throat> Specifically saying, he's Mark, John Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, and seems to have reconciled because he's he's now giving instructions to welcome John Mark. Right. Um, also, if we go to uh, Philemon 24 um, and sec and then a little bit after that, Second Titus 4:11. Uh, And so do Mark, Archerus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. There again, right? he mentions, yep, there again he mentions he mentions Mark as a fellow worker you know, further down the line after they um, they had split apart. And the same in, in 2 Timothy 4.11. So you can see some, they've reconciled, they come back together. And um, the time of writing uh, for Mark is, is also kind of in the 50 to 60 AD time frame, likely written in, in Rome. So it's, it's believed that this is where, where Peter spent the end of his life. Uh, Peter had been, been um, preaching a lot in Rome, and, and that, that, uh, that Mark was there together with, with Peter in Rome at the time when he, when he wrote this down. This one is a little bit different in that it seems to be written to Gentile believers who are in Rome. And, and the reason we believe that is because this goes into more detail about explaining Jewish traditions. So the, the Jewish traditions, uh, obviously if you're writing to Jews, you don't have to explain that. Right? And here he goes more into explaining that because it's believed to be written more to the, to the Gentile believers. Um, also, What's interesting is, is it goes through and, and documents um, the faith and, and makes it clear. And the time of writing is just prior to the fire in Rome, which was started by Nero. And this resulted in persecution of Christians in Rome because they were believed, because he spread the word that it was the Christians that, that made this, um, this fire happen. So that's, uh, you know, Interesting point that the that the that the Holy Spirit went through and said, "Okay, we got to document this. We got to have this down." He impressioned it on them to have it ready because the persecution was coming. All right, the main themes here are the cross, uh, discipleship, the teachings of Jesus. Um, here it, it lists more about like how uh, what they call the messianic secret that Jesus continued to tell the disciples to hold back from telling people that he was the Messiah, right, that he warns them not to do this. And then it also talks about, you know, of course, you know, proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, the next one is, is, um, is Luke. Luke also was not one of the 12 disciples. Um, not specifically named here, um, but it's clear that this is is a companion to Acts, and that Acts was written by Luke, and this is, follows exactly the same structure and, and word framing and, and the way it's written 
as well as that is written to, uh, to Theophilus. Um, the name Theophilus is, means one who loves God, right? So it, 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 we tend to believe, because it specifically calls him excellence Theophilus, that it's not just to anyone who loves God, that it's a specific person, but it may have been some kind of, of nickname or some code name, or it may have been somebody's actual real name. We don't know much about Theophilus other than he was the recipient of both Luke and Acts, that he was the intended recipient of these uh, of these letters. And it was more of like an re investigative reporting that Luke did. Also kind of a little bit later time frame that this was written more from like 60 AD to 80 AD. Um, and and uh, also believed to have been possibly written in Rome. And then, or that Theophilus was in Rome and it was sent to Rome. So the, there's a lot of of documentation that it, that it could be either way, but more likely it was written in Rome than Theophilus being in Rome. Um, the theme, this one really goes into the teachings and the works of Jesus as the way to salvation, as well as um, the universa universality of the gospel, that it's, it goes beyond Jews and extends out to the Gentiles. And that's a, you know, really how it flows nicely into Acts as well, where it, it goes straight, you know, and you can see the, the progression there of, of this gospel right into, into Acts. Um, emphasis on prayer and the joy of the good news, as well as there's some additional notes here about, about women and the role that they played in, in helping the disciples. Um, if we can read Luke 8, 1 through 3. this Jesus traveled from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had been cast out. Joanna the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household so she held a pretty high position, right, if she was managing Herod's household. And then uh, Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So what, what does that mean, they were helping support them out of their own, own means? So they were, they were traveling with them, um, but also the, the 12 didn't, didn't, um, didn't make money from the gospel, right? So they, they may have been some financial support, it may have been some taking care of them, it may have been taking care of the people around um, the disciples and helping them out. So there's a lot of, of the, their ministry was, was extremely important to helping the 12 in their ministry as well. Okay, uh, John. So John is written completely different from it, right? The, 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 the correlation between John and the other three is, 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 is starkly different. You can go through the other three, you can compare them side by side, and you can see very much the same stories, almost written in the same way. And John is written from an eyewitness account from someone who was very deeply um, close to Jesus, but also wanted to make his own um, writing about what happened. And so you can see that it, it parallels, but it is also uh, goes into a um, very different approach. Um, believed to be written in two, two, two different options. Many believe it's written near John's end of life in 85 AD, um, or it could have also been in the 50 AD to 70 AD time frame like the others. Um, is written very different in that it, it dives deeper into topics where the other three kind of underdeveloped some topics. It goes into a lot deeper um, topics as, as far as not as quite as many, but very much detail and depth 
of the topics that it goes into. Um, the signs that Jesus performed in his ministry uh, goes more into theology than the others. Uh, shows strong relationship between the Father and the Son. Um, here it's documented, you know, Jesus talking to Nicodemus and, and having to be born again. As well as um, John 20, 31 shows the main theme of this one. Here, John, I'll start with John 20, 30. And it says, uh, Jesus did many other miracles, signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So the, the total theme, the purpose of him writing this book is to identify Jesus as the Son, the Christ, and to convince others to believe in him to be saved. So I think, um, you know, as we continue to go through, it's very significant that there's, that there's four of them, right? So you get a lot of different views that collaborate um, and that also show the importance that, that many people felt about this and that they, they also complement each other. They don't say something that, that completely discredits the other one. They're very much they're sending the same message. This is ex extremely important uh, to us as believers and to people who don't believe um, to, to refute them saying, hey, this, these guys got to, you know, we're telling different things. That's not the case. Very much telling the same story. Um, two of these were first-hand accounts, two were retellings. I think that there's some significance to that in the, the way that um, that we can see that you know they were documented and that they, they tell things that it was it was not only the people that, that spent the twelve, but there was other believers, right, that, that are clearly, you know, wanting to make sure that they send the message to others as well. Um, there's no book written by Jesus. That's I think a little bit interesting, right? So he he entrusted all the other people around him to document and carry the message after he left. He did not write something down. He did not create a scroll of Jesus. That's that's not there. So he empowered and through the Holy Spirit and the plan of God to do it through us, through people that were there and through us as believers today. Um, the narratives continue to tell that story. Um, why do you think it was such a long time that after the death and resurrection of Jesus that these were written. Is there significance in that? They thought Christ was going to return. They thought he was going to return yeah. right there. Yeah. They thought he was going to return quickly. I think the message was, was very... Um, was very much alive at that time, and I, I think you're right. I think that they did not believe that that maybe they would see death before he before he returned. Well, it was the Christians were being scattered all over. Yeah. They needed some kind of formal way of communicating. Yeah, that's also true. So they they uh, uh, what uh, what Shirley was saying was it was the the gospel was growing and spreading out. And they needed some way to keep the message consistent between all the people as, as it went from from Jerusalem out to the Gentile nations. Yeah. Is there any knowledge of how long it took them to write the books? Maybe they didn't get done until that time. It took ten or twenty years to write. The book. Could could be. I I, I I don't have any insight on that. Um, you know, could be, could could have taken quite some time to to, to go through and, and write it. Yeah, they've also were extremely busy with the ministry, so it, it, it may have taken them. You know, not sure how many days they had to sit down and, and write as well. Yeah.
The author also suggests that to understand more about uh, the Gospels, that, that there's other texts that you can go through and read to learn more about Jewish culture at the time, um, the influence of Rome, Roman culture at the time, right? Because, because it was, Jerusalem was, was an occupied territory by Rome, governed by Rome. Um, so they, they have, I've listed the two books here uh, that, that, were, that were recommended, which is The Backgrounds of Early Christianity by Everett Ferguson and Jerusalem mm -hmm. in the Times of Joachim Jeremias. I, I personally have not read either of these books, but the authors of, of the book that we're studying out of um, has recommended them, so, so maybe I'll, I'll do that at some point. I have not. Um, and then when we when we look, they, they definitely document Jesus' teachings, right? So and, and he goes through a few different forms of teaching. And, and Jesus used a wide variety of ways to teach and, and provide his message, message, right? So one is direct instruction where he's pointedly said, this is the way to do something, or this is what's right, this is what's wrong. Um, it, it, other times he was he was also a master of hyperbole, right? So in that he would kind of sum, overstate something to make his point. Like, he is, it's, it's better to cut off your arm than allow your arm to, to, have, to, allow your arm to sin, right? Or, or to gouge out your eye and go to heaven with one eye missing. Um, I don't believe, believe he really intended people to do that, but that was you know, something he really wanted to make a point, so he, he made an over-exaggeration, right? Um, and those are those are found in Matthew 5:29 and, and Mark 9, 43 through 48. We won't go there, but um, but you can read them there. And then also through parables. So he, the parables are really interesting that he spoke in in ways that were um, hard to understand, right? So and 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 wanted the people to think about it, but also hard to understand. And and some of this is 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 also to to um, fulfill the prophecy in Isaiah, right? That they will be ever seeing and ever hearing, but never understanding, right? And so that's part of it. Part of it is also to, to get the, the story um, a little bit memorable so that when, he, when they do get the meaning, that it's, it's, um, it, it takes a little bit more punch when he goes directly to the disciples. Can you say that the, the Christian people would understand it and the unstable will not? Yep, yes. And then he's, he, he goes through several proverbs, so he references proverbs um, in Matthew 6, 21 and 24, and similes and metaphors in Matthew um, 5, 13 and 10, 16. And then he does some poetry. If you look at, at Matthew 7, 6 through 8, and Luke 27 through 28, there's some poetry in, in his writing, um, so that's, or his teachings. Oftentimes he's answering questions, um, a little bit of irony, uh, Matthew 16, 2 through 3. Uh, but when you're going through these different types of uh, discussions and, and the tools that are used in, in transferring his message, you know, also think about which audience he's, he's giving it to, right? So certain audiences he, he communicated in certain ways. And, and the large crowds, he would approach a different way than he, than he went to his opponents or to his his to the 12 disciples. So his opponents, he's always, you know, referencing scripture back to the opponents, very often. And the large crowds, he would use more stories and make it relatable, also share the, the parables, and then a lot of the direct instruction to the 12 disciples, right? Where he was a little bit closer, he would give them direct instruction and, and sometimes a little bit of, of rebuke for them not getting it, right? Uh, but, but he would share the full meaning with them so that they could take the message on uh, from there, so that it was really clear. A um, couple other things to, to think about um, is, is, is when you're reading it, you can, you can look to the other, because there is so much similarity between the three synoptic Gospels, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that, that you can find the same story, but it's it's same but different, right? It's it's written in a little different way, but it's very similar. 
So it, it, they, the authors bring up the concept of thinking horizontally. So, okay, when you, when you re read something and you want to look, learn a little bit more about it, you know, read from one of the other three books and see if it says a little differently. Or, if, or the, 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 the story that it's using it in and, and what you might gain from the context. It might be a little different in the way that it's, it's approached, so you might be able to get a little bit more rounded view of, of the meaning. Um, I still like also using like a study Bible, you know, which gives you some upfront information, but also has, has notes on each chapter and verse, as well as, as references where you can go see the other reference in the other, in the other chapters, or the other books, kind of makes it a little easier to find those types of things. Um, and and um, again, he thinks that, you know, because they're so common, common stories, common um, wording, that they really believe that this was coming from a common source originally. Not just the life of Jesus, but some common um, you know, preaching or, or, or teaching that, that most of these three books come from. Um, the other thing that, they, that, they, that, that can help with, with going side by side, there are synopsis. Um, which, which, which puts them as well side by side for all four Gospels. Um, one of the ones that they suggest here is the synopsis of the four Gospels, you know, very, very uh, original title, but this is by Kurt Aylin. And um, here on the next page, you can see an example of, of, of how they, they, they have the same, same story, but, but a little differently here, um, side by side. And so you can see here at, at, on the left, it says, it, it, it's, it's talking a little bit more about the end times. And it says, you know, Matthew says, so when you see the desolate sacrilege standing in the holy place as spoken by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand that those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Mark is very similar. When you look at Luke, it's a little bit different, right? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know its desolation has come here. And then it come, it skips a little down to then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. So it's it's a little bit different approach to the same story. Um, believed to be the same the same thing. Um, it, this is this is is something that that you have to get from reading the the, the three of them or the the, uh, that they might not get from one or the other exactly the same, the same fullness of it. The other thing is to, to think also vertically. Think about how it was when Jesus was saying what he was saying, right? So where was he? What he was um, communicating to the Jews. Um, think about the way the author is, is using the story. So Matthew uh, 21 through 15, maybe we could go there and, and take a look at this one. Does anybody like to read read this one? You, you say twenty thirteen. Uh, twenty verses one through fifteen. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a Darius for the day and sent them on to, into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in the, my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at uh, at about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and find, found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they answered. He said unto them, you also go and work in my vineyard. 
When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the rest. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, each received a Darius. So when they came, when those came who were hired first, they explained, expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a Darius. <clears throat> when they received it, they began to grumble against the land order owner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have paid them equal to us who bore the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Darius? Take your pay and go. I want to give you the one give the one who hired who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Yep. Thank you. So the author of this book makes the suggestion that that story is written um, differently than what it was intended to, originally by Jesus. So it, it says that, that likely Jesus told this to justify his forgiveness of sinners opposed to Pharisees and self-righteousness. What you see in the Bible is that the story goes from just before that when Jesus is talking about directly to the disciples and he makes this, the correlation of, of the, the just prior verses says, but many who are last will be first and many who are first will be last, right? So that, I, I struggle a little bit with, with the interpretation of, of the author of this book, right? Because it, it seems to flow very well in the story of Matthew. I, I'm not sure if Jesus really used this in a different way than, than what Matthew says here. Um, I don't know your guys' opinion, but I, 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 I think it's, it's a little strange that they bring up this concept in this book. Um, but I, but maybe, maybe I'm reading it incorrectly, I don't know. Any thoughts? Are the ideas really in conflict, or is it, to me, it seems like it applies both ways. It does, yes. But, but what he's, he's suggesting is that um, as you're reading the stories, you know, that, that, that you might be able to, to think that about, in a different way, that Jesus might have been using the story differently than the author. And, and I think that's a little, could be, um, it, it contradicts a little bit the way that the authors taught us for other books of the Bible, right? We were told very much to read the text as a plain text and, and to not draw too much conclusions from it. And here now they're taking a, a different approach, which, which seems strange to me, right? And it also is, is um, when you specifically talk about you know, the teachings of Jesus and, and you know, that, that, you know, at the end of, of, of Revelation it also talks, or it talks about not adding to the word or taking away from the word, that I, I struggle with the concept of trying to frame it and putting it that Jesus might have been using it different than the authors of the Gospels. I guess I always thought of the denarius as being salvation, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess I always thought it doesn't matter if you've been in the church for 20 years, you know, if, if you've gotten saved, if you've asked for um, God and believe Him um, and confess your sins, you're saved. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it happens then or whether it happens at your last gasp of breath yep. and you've been an alcoholic or a drug abuser or like a felon or whatever. Um, you still you still have that. You still have that ability to choose Christ at the very last moment, and you will be saved. And you know, because we've all sinned. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think that's the good news. That's one of the great news points. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Go ahead. Is there a little bit of works versus grace in the two views? Well, I, I think that, that that definitely seems to be one of the things that he was he was teaching in gas, right? Yeah. In here, and, and that's one of the things that the author of this book seems to be suggesting is that he used it to combat that against um, against Pharisees, which which may have been the case, um, you know. But it's just an interesting divergent approach to to this. So it's, it it. It, it's because because I think what they're suggesting is not only that specific story, but also you know other stories to take a look and see if there was a maybe a different intention than Jesus had than the authors before. I think we saw a little bit of that go on in, in the Jesus movement. Yeah, uh, where a lot of what God was doing at that time was rejected by. Uh, the historical uh, Christian view and there was a newness and a difference that sometimes was not acknowledged or even rejected. Okay. The other thing that they start to that they they do um, want to look at what wants to look like, with, which is is maybe a little bit you know interesting. I think is is you know why was this specific story selected, and and, and is it arranged and adapted to this context? So these are things we can look at when we're interpreting the gospels. Um, when we go to hermeneutics, which is we talked about before, is applying God's word to today. Then, um, then this, you know, it goes into okay. Many situations are not exactly the same, but um, the the meaning can, in principle, can still ring true today. So, like, it's no Roman soldiers saying here, carry my, my gear for a while, right? Uh, but. But going the extra mile still is something that should be relevant in Christians' lives today, um, as well as you know to to not get caught up too much in legalism, uh, but but you know follow the, the the teachings of Jesus in love, mercy, and grace. Us as Christians, uh, but be mindful also of the fact that there are some rules that that are, are part of it as well. Jesus did not only um, came with the message of grace, but also in some cases raised raised a little bit the bar of, of taking the approach of okay, if you if you have hate in your heart, that's considered murder, right? That's a, a, a clear teaching from Jesus, and so that's that's a little bit raising the bar of hey, you know, just be careful of your thoughts, be careful of of, of how you think about others, um, but also, you know, His grace will cover it. Like we talked the first and the last, and, and at the end, you know, if, if you ask for forgiveness and repent, then then um, then he can forgive us. Um, the miracles function as showing the power of the Lord and that Jesus was and is God. Um, the story of the rich Shan man shows the difficulty of loving. Um, Earthly things, you know, the you know, the world, but you know, God is also possible. Makes a way for someone to get to heaven, right? That through God, all things are possible. Um, and, and ultimately, the New Testament points to the fulfillment of the Old Testament through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and ultimately the the joy of us meeting them in the end. So. That's that's what I have for today. Any questions, comments? New covenant. What's that? A new covenant. A new covenant. That, from the old covenant of the um, the law. The law. Yes. The new covenant through Jesus. Yeah.
and bringing in the the non-Jews and the, the Gentiles under the under the fold. Yeah. Next week we're going to be talking more about the parables, a little bit more focused on the parables. So that should be uh, a little bit interesting. Um, thank you. Appreciate everybody's comments here. And, and, and wish you guys all blessings this week and have a good day.